Neuromuscular conditions are by their nature complicated. Time to take some time out and focus on what's really important here. Let's explain. Hello, I'm Gavin Spence, children's orthopaedic surgeon originally from London, now working at Bajil Hospital for Advanced Surgery in Dubai. Welcome to this video, which is part of the children's orthopaedic series. I'm here every week discussing conditions that people find confusing or are just looking for more information about. If you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like us to include in this series, then please comment and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You'll find a link to all of our videos, as well as loads more information on these conditions on our website. There's a link in the description below. Neuromuscular conditions affect nerve tissue primarily, usually brain or spinal cord, so cerebral palsy would be the commonest example. Spina bifida is another good example. The effects on the bones and the joints are secondary to that, and we orthopaedic surgeons, we normally get involved when there's a question about whether orthopaedic surgery can help with mobility problems. So in order to answer that question, there's a few important things to keep in mind as I understand it. The first is always to remember that neuromuscular conditions affect several body systems. It's not just about mobility. Children with cerebral palsy, for example, not uncommonly have problems with vision, with speech and language, seizures, behavioral problems, and so on and so forth. So it's really important to have a team-based approach to these problems and to try and work out what the priorities actually are because these children are at risk of having their entire lives medicalized if we're not careful and their childhoods disappear in a tsunami of different therapies and appointments. So important to focus on the priorities. Well, what are those priorities? Well, as regards orthopedics, it's certainly not about correcting deformities just because we see they're there. It's not even about heroic attempts to get children walking when they're struggling to do that. It's actually deeper than that. So what we're really trying to do here is to help children lead lives that are as independent as possible and as integrated into society as possible. Why is that? Well, if you ask adults with cerebral palsy what they consider the most important parts of their lives, it's social communication and social interaction that they consider the most important. Mobility doesn't actually come that high up the list. So walking's important, but it's not essential. What is important is some sort of functional mobility. So mobility that gets the job done by whatever means necessary. So it might be that surgery is a useful route to that. It could equally be that physiotherapy or a particular type of splint or a walking aid or a wheelchair equally provides something much more useful. Of course the reality is in a lot of children's cases all of those things are going to be required and at different points in their lives. It's another area where a team-based approach is really important. When it comes to orthopaedic surgery itself in these conditions, we have a much clearer understanding of the complexity of the problem than we ever used to. So it used to be thought, particularly in cerebral palsy, that the most important thing was the development of abnormalities of muscle tone, spasticity usually, as well as the development of contracture, and these were thought to be the main obstacles to mobility. But we now understand that actually muscle volume and muscle strength are really important players in determining children's mobility. What does all that mean in practical terms? Okay, so consider two children each walking on their toes with a neuromuscular condition. That's a pretty common scenario in clinic. So the first child might be doing that because she has a structural problem. She's actually trying to walk with her heels flat on the ground, but can't, she's prevented from doing that. Whereas the child next to her, he's walking on his toes because he actually gets an advantage from it. Now, that might sound a bit strange because walking on your toes is a rather precarious way to get around the world. You're rather prone to falling frequently, but it does have advantages actually. If, for example, you find it difficult to get your knees straight, then walking on your toes helps you to do that. We see that quite commonly in children with certain muscular dystrophies or in children with cerebral palsy who often have very weak calf muscles, then walking on your toes saves you from having to generate those large amounts of power you need to drive yourself forward. So if you operate on the first child to get rid of the toe walking, you're probably going to do her a lot of favours. But if you operate on the second child or do other things to take away the toe walking, like for example putting serial plaster casts on or injecting Botox into muscles that are already weak, then sure, you'll take away the toe walking, but you're probably not going to do any favours in terms of functional mobility. So the interventions we use in neuromuscular conditions are actually relatively simple on the whole. The real tough thing is the decision making, and again, it's where a team-based approach is so useful. So one final point to make about neuromuscular conditions, and that's this. 
Everything I've talked about in this video up until now has been about disability. But of course, these children have abilities as well. They have interests and skills and talents, same as any other children do. And those deserve to be nurtured, really. You could argue in these children more than any others, because these are great routes into that social interaction that I talked about earlier. So our job as clinicians is to support that where we can. Sometimes that means knowing when actually to get out of the way and not put obstacles in their way and allow these things to develop by themselves. So that's all for this week. That's all on neuromuscular conditions. If you have any questions arising from topics raised in this video, please put them in the comments. I'll respond as soon as I can. If you found the video helpful, please hit that like button, share it with anybody else you think might be interested and subscribe to our channel. And I'll be back next week with another video in the children's orthopedic series, taking kid stuff seriously. Mm -hmm.